Mike started to um, spoke on the Holy Spirit. He talked, uh, spoke a lot about the, the person of the Holy Spirit, the fact of who who the Holy Spirit is. That he's not just some all bodiless orb floating around, but he is actually God. He is a person of the Godhead and equally of one essence with the Father and the Son. And so today we're going to continue on. Last week he spoke a little bit about um, the Holy Spirit's role, and I'm just going to continue on today. And with the role, um, we're also going to go into his work. And what is the reality of that in our life? What is, it, what is the reality of God the Holy Spirit in my life? Because there is so much happening around in the world today. There are so many opinions. There are so many trends. That it's important that we know the truth of God, the truth of the Holy Spirit. And we know what it is when we are being led by God and we are representing him, representing him well that we know how to do that. And also, that we recognise when people aren't honouring God with either their actions or their words, so that we can walk, so we can discern and walk in truth. So, if you want to open your Bibles up to 1 John, 1 John chapter 5. But before I read that out to you, you keep heading there. 1 John chapter 5. I just want to read a couple of quotes to you, or just one actually to start off with. It is that life is lifeless without God. It is redemption by God, righteousness of God, the worship before God, the praise to God, the adoration of God. Life is to be imbued with God. Life is God. God doesn't, and God never offers to mankind what already enslaves him. Because God is life. So, 1 John chapter 5, and I'll read through eight verses in here. So, 1 John chapter 5. It says, Whoever believes, verse 1, 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three are green in one. Mm. A great statement in showing God and the relationship that we have with him, what he desires of us, and the working together, the unity, the one in essence of God, the triune God. So just as a reminder, I'm just going to read through the statement, out of the statement of faith, what we have written there, about the Holy Spirit. We have it written there as extracts out of the scripture. And if you, you should each have a copy of the statement of faith, and there are scripture references put at the bottom, and I'd encourage you to read it through for yourself afterwards, again and again. And be encouraged, be reminded, be strengthened of who God is. So in the statement of faith, we have written, we believe that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead. He is the one who convicts humanity of sin, points them to Christ, leads them to repentance and creates faith within them. We believe God the Holy Spirit regenerates and indwells those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Saviour. It is God the Holy Spirit who immerses all believers into the body of Christ. He bestows the gifts of the Spirit at salvation as he wills on each and every believer. The Holy Spirit enables the working of the gifts of the Spirit and helps to manifest the fruit of the indwelling Spirit in, the, in each believer. As we read through Scripture, 
There are many references, many descriptions, many applicational verses that come out about the Holy Spirit. And often when different people are spoken, including myself, myself, sometimes we just give a short insert of something and it doesn't really give the whole picture, does it? Unless you actually pursue it yourself. It might take maybe over six or twelve months or maybe even six or twelve years to hear all the references and it's a bit hard over that length of time to try and put it all together, isn't it? But what is the role of the Holy Spirit? Do we really have him? And if we do, what is his role? What is his work? How do we recognise it? What's the reality of it all? And so that's what we want to achieve here today, building what, on what Mike's laid as a foundation last week about the reality of who he is. So we're going to look primarily at the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. But up front I want to say that we've got a blessed position. If, you've, if your faith is in Jesus Christ as your Saviour, as your Redeemer, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. You are redeemed. You have all the spiritual blessings that God gives you. Amen. And it happens right at salvation. And a part of that is God himself. Mm. God himself. But if we were to just, for a moment, we're going to primarily look in from the time of Acts through to now, in what we say, but just to step back in time, just to understand and appreciate our privileged position. If you were back in pre-Acts 1, you would find that probably most of us or none of us would have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only ever came on people according to God's will and was determined, and that was determined by a task or a time or obedience that God wished to achieve through that person. An example would be King Saul. We read in Scripture that the Holy Spirit came upon him as God willed and made that happen. He came upon King Saul. But then when he got to the point of a certain amount of disobedience, it says that the Holy Spirit left him and God actually sent an evil spirit to torment him. And at the same time, when the Holy Spirit left, uh, left King Saul, around the same time, it says that King David received the Holy Spirit and it was all with him to the end of his life. If you were to go back to the time of the Exodus, when they were building the temple, in Exodus 31 you read, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called Bezalel, the son of Uri, of Uri, the son of Earth, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, that is, in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge, for all manner of workmanship. God gave him himself to this man so that he could work crafts, have, have a physical skill to help bring about the temple for the, for the Jewish people, for God's people there and then. So it was always just for a task, for a time, for a purpose, always, but always according to God's will and accord, according to God's designed purpose, his providence, his sovereignty. Then as we go through, if you continue reading through scripture, you get to Isaiah, for example, and you read as a mark of the coming Messiah, you would read the promised Holy Spirit would be upon this promised Messiah, this chosen one who is coming. And then you jump forward and then we see in the Gospels, you read that God gave the Holy Spirit temporarily, initially, to the disciples. They had him for a season and they were to operate according to his will, to his guidance, to his power. But they did not have him permanently. They did not have him permanently. But yet from the book of Acts, because Christ and the Father, God, the Son, and all the Holy Spirit, in their plan, their plan was that for every believer would have the Holy Spirit. Everyone who chose to look to Christ and understand that he is the Messiah, to understand their own wretchedness before him, their own sinful state, say, wow, this is the Messiah. I trust what he's done for me. Everyone received and everyone will receive the Holy Spirit who has their faith in him. Yes. So as we now start to move forward, as we look into the New Testament, we're going to look more of the role and the work of the Holy Spirit. What does it actually mean to us? What's happened? What, what does it mean? Because as we read through Scripture, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Do you not know 
that you are a temple of God and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. This is talking to believers. If you were to read Romans 8, Romans 8 and verse 9, it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So every believer has the Holy Spirit in him. If you continue reading, um, such as 1 Corinthians 6, similar to the first part I read from 1 Corinthians 3, it says in verse 19, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, What? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, which you have of God, and that you are not your own? You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So God's given himself to us. You can actually read later and read more of it in 2 Peter chapter 1. You'll read a lot about how he shared himself with us, his divine nature. God is in us. As believers, he is in us. We are we're his temple. He asks us that we would use our body in a representation of that, in a reality of that. So let's keep looking through scripture. Let's see what does it mean. How does it actually look like? So we've got the Holy Spirit in him. We're his temple. He's indwelling us. Why? He says he wants to use our body in that last reference. What's that all about? So let's keep going. Let's continue just to look to scripture and I'll make a comment. But mainly gain your understanding from scripture, from God himself. Because as we saw a month or so ago, this is the God-breathed, inspired Word of God. We each have a copy. That's what we need to rely on and be, equipped, um, be enlightened through the Holy Spirit in us. So let's, I'm going to go through and just talk about a few of the things that are, as a result, a few of the works, the results of having the Holy Spirit in us. Because it's a necessity to know. He's not just there and, well, okay, a bit like that unwanted Christmas gift, put it to the side or in the cupboard. But there's a great reality in having him in us. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one spirit we were all baptised into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink the one spirit. So it's the same spirit we all have, the same Holy Spirit. None of us got number one or number two or mark one or mark two of the Holy Spirit. There is only one. That's good. We only have the one Holy Spirit. He is in all of us, holy yes. and complete. In Ephesians chapter one, verse three, it builds on it and it says that you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In other words, when you were saved, you've got the whole lot. It's not that he, he came to Trevor and said, oh, whoops, ran out with him. I forgot, I sort of was caught off guard. No, we know who God is. We know he is true. And so he was prepared long ago. We read, as he continued to read through Ephesians chapter 1, we'll see that God long ago prepared all of what he wanted for me, for you personally, to equip us. He was ready. He was prepared in all his sufficiency. So as we can continue to read on, we see, we've seen that he is in every believer, and not only in every, every believer, but he puts us all into one body, and that is the body of Christ, the universal church of Christ. Not this church of Christ by name, but the literal, the real church of Christ. In John 14, John 14, verse 17, it says, that is the spirit of truth, who came, who the world cannot receive because he does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides in you and will be in you. So just another verse, just re-emphasising that the Holy Spirit is in every believer. You haven't missed out. There's no superior Christian and inferior Christian because of the level of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We all have the same. Romans 8, Romans 8, 16, it says... The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit 
that we are children of God. That we are children of God. We also read that he is our equipper. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a chapter that talks a lot about gifts. Not a complete list of gifts, but as an example. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 12, from verse 4 to 11. And it says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God, who works all things in all persons. But to each one, so that's even you and me, if to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. So that's a, a roundabout way or building on the fact that each of us have at least one gift by God, a gift of service that we can that use in service. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing. By the way, it's the only gift listed that has a plural. Gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Mm. And to another, the effecting of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, to another, this distinguishing of spirits. To another, for various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But the one and the same Spirit works all things, distinguishing to, sorry, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. So it is the Holy Spirit who gives to each of us, to every single believer, whoever was, whoever is, and whoever will be born again in the future. He is the one who gives everyone very quick, and he's the one who equips us. So it's not about me going and saying, God, I don't like this gift, or I prefer that gift, or getting sidetracked thinking a particular gift is better than I can pursue it. I can't. I need to pursue God and the equipping that he has given and made in me. Because he is sovereign, he is wise, it's not me. I've already, if I'm truly saved, I've already seen my shortcoming. I know I'm, I am insufficient, but yet in Christ I am sufficient. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4, 5 and 6 tell us that. We find our sufficiency through Christ in God. So it's important to understand that every single one of us, a part of the role of the Holy Spirit is, he equips every single one of us and he enables us to use those gifts. He enables us to use those gifts. So let's continue on. John 16 and verse 13. But when John 16, 13, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will disclose to you what is to come. So not only the obvious one coming out of these verses, that he will guide us, but I emphasised, he will speak. He will speak. He will disguise. Yeah. The Holy Spirit, a part of his role, part of his work in you, in me, is that he is making known to you, to me, the will and purpose of God. For me right now, in wherever I am, and in however he wants me to grow, in many ways. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. He communicates with us. He communicates with us. There are multiple verses that talk about it and talk about the reality of it. This is just a great verse that simply shows it three times that he's about communicating with us. He is, a, he is our guide, a light to our path. So as we continue on, let's turn to John 14, verses 16 and 17. John 14. John 14, 16 and 17 says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth 
whom the world cannot receive because he does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be with you. So he's our helper. Some translations might have comforter there. And just to understand that the reason you have this is so I think the reason you have comforted there is because of the Latin influence on translations many, many decades before. That he is our helper. Mm. It actually comes from the Latin word comforter. And footer at the end, a bit like we had Panadol Forte, the stronger one. And that's the first part of the word is about him being our helper, our aid. And someone who will step in for you. Imagine, young blokes, that you're on the footy field and someone's, you've got the football in front of you, you're bending over, about to pick it up, and you can see at the core of your eye the opposition. He's just coming in, he's 120 kilos, and he's just going to smack you. But your teammate, who you can't see, but you know you got him, he comes straight through and he shepherds the bloke out. He steps in for you. Now, any of us are a poor analogy of the Holy Spirit, but to get the meaning that the Holy Spirit always steps in for you in what you need. That's why you will read in Scripture that he is our intercessor, that he is our advocate, just like Christ is. When you're reading Scripture and it says, I will send another, it's another the same as. There's no level of superior, superiority or inferiority between Christ and the Holy Spirit. They are the one and the same essence. They are God. They are the one God. So let's continue, continue on here. If, we were, if you were to go down in John 14 to verse 26, it's, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now here, it's Christ talking to the disciples. But you can find it again and again through the epistles, talking in relevance to you and I, believers, that he will guide you, he will bring to remembrance. As he said, Christ said to the, uh, to the disciples, he would not leave them orphans. God has not saved us and then just left us to go off on our own. That'd be as foolish as a new mum and dad leaving their little infant, just being born, leaving them to defend for themselves. They can't even walk, can they? They can't even stand. They can't even feed themselves. And that's exactly the same as us, without God the Holy Spirit ministering to us, communicating to us, equipping us, bringing to remembrance, and in enlightening, giving us understanding of the Word. So let's continue on. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 17. And another part about the role of the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 17 says, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have our access in one Spirit to the Father. So because of what Christ has done through the work of the Spirit, we, can, we have access to the Father. That's an amazing, amazing privilege. If you understand before the cross, before Pentecost, before the redeem, redemption actually came into effect of the post-cross. The Old Testament covenant, through the Mosaic covenant, they could never do that. They could never approach God. They could not go into the Holy of Holies. Only one man was chosen could go in once a year. Imagine that. How faithful would you remain if you could only go to God, go in and chat with him face to face once a year? What a privilege we have. It's not that we've got to go off to a special room once a year, but we actually have God in us. The testimony's there. He communicates to our mind. He's put it out in black and white before us that we have God, the Holy Spirit, and we can approach him at any hour. So let's continue reading. In Romans 8, um, 27, Romans 8.27, I mentioned a verse earlier, I read a verse earlier from Romans 8.9, but let's go to Romans 8.27. I'll actually read from verse 26. 
Romans 8, 26 and 27, it says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we, do, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So he always intercedes. As before, I talked about the Cathay football example. He always intercedes. He always steps in. He is our advocate. He is our intercessor. One and the same like Christ is. But do you notice one thing then? According to the will of God. He won't. The Spirit doesn't act contrary to the will of the Father or the Son. The three are always one in agreement. So when he is acting, when he is interceding, when he is speaking to, to me, to you, he is always in do, doing it in unity with the Father and the Son, always according to the will of God, because he is God. There is no disunity in God. So let's continue on. So if this is all happening, if this is a reality, how should it be seen? How should it be evident? What is the working out of the Holy Spirit in me? If he is my helper, if he is my guide, if he is the communicator, if he is the true representation, not just the true representation, but the reality of God in me, what should be the reality that you and anybody else see in me of this? What should be the reality? There are three testimonies that should be in our life. Let's go through them. A very um, well-known passage, Galatians 5. Flick across to there, Galatians 5. Now, God is very precise. So, and I understand this slight difference in wording because of different translations, translators, and, but understand and pay attention to every single word that is written in Scripture. And if you want to get it clearer, go home and read it through the literal translation from the interlinear. Because God is very precise. Every word that he puts in is for yours and my benefit. Yeah. So as I read through this, even the little words, pay attention, they're significant. Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, so this is if, if the Spirit of God, if God the Holy Spirit is in me and working in me, this is what should be coming out of what I'm doing. Okay, This is what should be coming out of being produced in who I am and what I'm doing. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. They shouldn't be there, should they, when it's the Word of God. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions, with its passions and desires. If we Live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. We must walk with God because He opposes the ugliness in me. He opposes the ugliness. That last bit is my word, sorry. I should have changed my tone a bit. I'll say it again. We must walk with God opposed to our natural ugliness. When we walk with God, it is a pure aroma. It is a pure aroma before God. It is holy and acceptable. And we'll see that will come out later. So the first thing that should be evidence in my life, if I am, as in the book of Acts, you will read about Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit and goes on to preach. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit and went on to declare truths about God. By the way, that filled is when you were unpure. I've spoken before about this. I remember when Mum used to dye things in the trough in the laundry. Now, being an inquisitive young lad, I wasn't just content just to stand there and see the dye go through and things come out. What would you do? And it's stain your finger. The evidence should be there. I couldn't hide it to mum because I had a blue finger or whatever the colour was. But the evidence should be there more than if I've just had garlic for the last six months to eat. It should just be permeating out of me. God, the Holy Spirit, His presence, His overwhelming guide in my life, Him speaking to me in all truth, should be just 
oozing out of who I am. That should be a reality. If it's not, I need to mature a bit, don't I? There may be a lot. So these fruits should be coming out as a product of who we are, of the reality of God the Holy Spirit working in us. The opposite, of course, is 1 John 2. In 1 John 2, 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful, boastful pride of life is not of the Father, but is from the world. So the opposite is all about me. If I'm about all of, if I am solely about me or just momentarily all about me, in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, I'm not being led by God, am I? Even if, now this is the, the amazing thing. If you were to go back and read through Deuteronomy 13 and 14, for an example, or if you were to think through when Aaron and Moses were before Pharaoh and threw down the cane, God even allows and enables counterfeits. He talks about the devil himself is a counterfeit. So even if I come to you, if I work miracles, if I raise the dead, heal the sick, but yet I don't generally in my life, in my words, show the fruit of the Spirit, then what does God say? You're an angel of light. <laughs> If it's naturally in and of myself and God and not being led by the Holy Spirit, in Deuteronomy 13 and 18, for example, under the Old Covenant, you know what was to happen to them? Taken outside and stoned. And if you follow through in Scripture, and even into the New Testament, there are glimpses of it. God calls every single one of us to be 100% representing Him in truth. Now, so far as I've gone through, I don't know if you picked up, but there are multiple, around about 20 times so far, I've used the word true and truth, talking about God and God the Holy Spirit. Many of them have been scripture because God is truth. God is true. And so if I am truly doing the work of God, if I'm truly being led of the Holy Spirit, I will be true to God. And that's why the true fruits will then come out. Okay? The true fruits will then come out. So let's continue on and go to John 15. Now John 15 is about the vine, the true vine. John 15 and verses 3 and 4. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So this is Jesus speaking here. And verse 4 says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless, unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. So it's not just that we can show the works of the Holy Spirit, we'll be a part of the works of the Holy Spirit just simply because we're saved, just because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We must be having that honourable, true relationship through Christ with the Father. We must be living the true relationship that we are given with God. We can't be living hypocritical. Just because we got saved 50 years ago, yes, we may, we do have God. We do have by the Holy Spirit. We are saved. But to show the fruits, the reality is we must be abiding, dwelling, being one and the same with Christ in His will, in His desire for our lives. So that's the one key testimony in my life. If I am, if you are, being filled by the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, and understand, I've clarified before, filled means that you are guided, that you are 100% imbued, permeating. Okay? Because the scripture clearly say, says that we all get the Holy Spirit wholly and completely at salvation. So if we continue on now, the first side is that we have the fruits of the Spirit if I'm really filled and led by the Holy Spirit. The second one is down in Ephesians 5, 9 and 10. That's on the back of our toilet door. Ephesians 5, 9 and 10. This is talking about my character, about your character. It says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, 
righteousness and truth. And what, what does this do? Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So what does it mean when it says, in all goodness, righteousness and truth? You know, do we, we just take a postmodernist approach here and just all sort of give our own definition, taken on board in how we want to? No, as I said before, every word that God uses is for inten very intentional and has a purpose in it. He uses it, that word because of its meaning, because how he wants to communicate his mind, his heart, to us, to me. So let's look at it. What does it mean, goodness? That means active goodness, benevolence, a disposition of character. In other words, who you really are. A zeal for goodness and truth. And it will be shown out that a person will do and say what they must do and say in all goodness and truth. So they will be about doing what needs to be done. Whether it be an act of service, or, or correcting, or admonishing, wherever the scope is, they will do it in all grace and love. It will be done in truth. So that is what he's talking about there. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. So part of your character, part of my character, of the Holy Spirit being in me, a part of his work in me and his role, is that goodness will characterise me. I shouldn't be stingy and not unhelpful. I should be passionate about helping people, however God leads me. Righteousness. So if the, it says here in verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all right, goodness and righteousness. Righteousness, he talks about, the righteousness of God is seen and shown in me. That's pretty plain and simple, isn't it? That's amazing. So that's what God says my character needs to be. That the righteousness of God would be seen or shown in me. It would be in my disposition. It would be in my conduct. That I would be testifying of the true righteousness of God. Not my version, but the true righteousness of God. And the third one, truth. That the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth. Truth. The love of truth is seen in them sincerely. So they don't try to compromise. They don't try to twist scripture. They pursue God on their knees passionately in prayer. They earnestly cry out to God, wanting to know the true heart of God in his word, understanding as they read through it, that they will have clarity and that then they will be able to communicate that out clearly in words and conduct. True and sincere holiness. So this is what should be in our character. There are the fruits which are the products from Galatians 5. Ephesians 5 talks about character. Does that character, is that what characterises me? Do I have in my life that goodness, that righteousness, that truth oozing out of me, which is evidence of the Holy Spirit in me? Is that where my passion is? Or is that like the example when I last spoke? I can still, even though we don't have the same GPS, but we used to swap the same GPS from our tractor to our header, and then from our header back to the tractor. And every time you did it, for some reason, it would drop the foot pedal off. The foot pedal is a switch which helped you to engage or disengage on the line. And so every, twice every year, you used to have to go in and set up that function. You just had to. And I can tell you now, it's still on page 84. There are details of what I know. I needed to know. For things to function correctly. If I don't pursue God, if I don't have these as a character in my life, if I haven't done the foundational basic growth that's in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 11, then I'm going to be deficient, aren't I? That's good. I will be deficient. There's no arguing about that. I can't sidestep what God ordains and plans and sets there. I can cry out and try, but there are quick consequences. I will not be effective. I will end up getting that sore finger having to push, or a lamb would on the header, pushing the GPS to engage and disengage all the time. 
Instead, just find out it easy just tap your foot. I will be ineffective for the pain when the Holy Spirit cannot perform his role and his work in me because I have lacked diligence. I have lacked pursuing God for all of what he offers me. So let's continue on. So just one thing though before we do. These three characteristics that should be in me, did you notice here again the word truth and true that was coming through repetitively? And yet, did you grasp that not one of those characteristics is passive? We can't be passive in any way if we're going to be representing God. God should be evident. God should be evident, he must be evident, if I am truly led by the Holy Spirit. If they're not evident, like I said before, I've got to grow up. I've got to allow God to do the work in me. So let's continue on. In As we continue on, it's so important that we correctly represent God. There's no two versions of God. God is God. When these characteristics are at the forefront, at our forefront, when this is who we are before God, we are the one who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled in the sense that we are being led by Him completely. It's not me, it's Him doing the work. So it's essential. So as I said before, just like in Acts 4, then Peter was filled. And we also read about Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are other examples of how I've talked about people being filled. It is that they were imbued. Permeated. Now, there's a, a word in, as you go through the epistles, I ask that you do it when you go home when this afternoon. Husbands and wives, brothers, sisters, dads, encourage each other. There is a word that you and I don't like when it's, well, for most of the time, you will find repeatedly through there, God calls us to be diligent. If I am to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I can't go haphazard, give it a bit of a go. Yeah, maybe today, but not tomorrow. God calls us to be diligent. He calls us to be prepared. So the three signs of whether I'm filled, whether I'm being led, whether I'm active for God, whether the Holy Spirit is truly the one who is speaking, acting out through me. First one is the fruit of the Spirit. Now the works of what's coming out of me, the fruit of the Spirit will, will show it will be there. The second, that there will be the genuine characterising of God coming out of me. That goodness, that righteousness, that truth, it will be there. And guess what the next word is? What will be the evidence? True or truth. The word of God. When I do actually speak, when I do actually declare God, whether it's up here in a conversation with you or anybody else, it will always be true to God. During um, the last few days that I was on the chaser, just before we finished harvesting, I was listening to a number of um, podcasts and actually watched a little bit, a bit on YouTube. And I was, yeah, anyway, disappointed. There was this bloke that he, he believed he had the gift of prophecy and the gift of healing. But then when he actually worked it out, when he actually got up before he actually was going to perform any of this, he spoke another gospel. Hmm. He said that he got saved through a false way. It wasn't through faith in Christ. And when he explained what salvation was, he gave a false salvation. He was telling the audience that they were good enough, that God came to save them because they were good. What heresy, what blasphemy. Hmm. If I stood here and did that, no matter, even if I could work a miracle, you would need to run from me. Yes. You need to remove me from fellowship unless I repented because it's not true to God. All the way through scripture we read of how truth is important to God. Whether you look at God as a triune Godhead or you look at the Father or the Son or the Spirit it was always the Father of truth the Spirit of truth the Son of truth. Jesus said he is the way, the what? Truth. Truth and the life. Truth is so important. So if I'm not speaking out truth, 
if what I'm saying does not line up meticulously with the Word of God, if I deliberately choose to not speak the words of God, then I'm not to be listened to. That is what God says when you read through. In Ephesians, sorry, in 1 Peter chapter 4, Ian reminded us of our second last board meeting. It says there that when we speak, we are to speak the words of God. We are to speak His truth. I can't just alter it a bit, give my opinion on it. We are to speak the words of God if we are led by God, if we are his child representing him, is of the utmost importance. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4. I'll read it out at the end. So, earlier on I read a passage from 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. But I just want to read um, only from verse 5 to 7 this time. I'll read a bit more at the, at the beginning. And it says in 1 John 5 verse 5, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that, that came by water and blood. Water and blood, talking about his baptism, the testimony there, and his sufficiency in his crucifixion, his sacrifice for us. This is he that came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And he is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. The Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So they all bear record. They are all one. They are all truth. They are all working for your benefit, for the benefit of all of mankind. Because the work of the Spirit, the reality of it is in the world, that he is convicting the world of sin, he is convicting the world of the need of repentance and come judgment on the natural sinful state. So as I finish up here, in John 16, 13, it says that when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. That is the reality of the Holy Spirit in you. God in you. God in you. Get your mind around that. Understand, grasp who God is. And that he is sharing himself with me. He's already credited his righteousness to me. Christ has already died for me. And risen again to give me life. So, right at the beginning I talked about life. What is life? I've lost my page. There it is. So, what is life? It is lifeless without God. It is redemption by God. It is the righteousness of God. It is the worship before God. It is the praise to God. It is to be imbued with God. It is all God. Life is God. Life is found in God. There's no other, no other way to have true life and happiness and fulfilment in it. So in summary and closing, have you noticed that truth is important to God and that we need to represent him truthfully? God declares the true work of the Holy Spirit in each and every believer and that will always produce true fruit that honours God by the one who is exhibiting the true character that honours God and speaking the truth of God. I'll read that out again. God declares in his word that the true work of the Holy Spirit in each and every believer will always produce true fruit that honours God by the one exhibiting the true character that honours God and speaking the truth of God. Truth is always the evidence of God in you, the work of the Holy Spirit in you. These three are always to be present in every single one of us, not just the pastor, not just the seminary, but in every single one of us. Each of us are having us evident coming out of us because of the Holy Spirit. The fruit 
the character and the words that are of God. So being led by the Spirit of God, when we have these three, we are being led by the Spirit of God. We are filled by the Spirit of God. It's not just a fact in Acts, it's a reality for today. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. I'm just going to close by reading 1 Peter chapter 4, which I referenced before. 1 Peter chapter 4. And verses 10 and 11. It says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of, of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs all glory, dominion, ever and ever. Amen. Amen. That is our God. That is my God. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Grace is a word that comes to my Lord. It's not just a religious word, but it's a reality with you. Lord, your work in us, the work of your spirit in us, the role in us. Lord, salvation would have just been enough, but yet that's not enough when you are the one who is sovereign. So Lord, I thank you so much that you've given us the awesome privilege of having you in us, that you share yourself with us. And as your servants who are growing in you, I just thank you that you've just equipped us so well. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. The truths are all here written in your word, but Lord, they must be a reality, we know that. So Lord, help us. Help us to realise that you've got to be a priority in our lives, Lord. We've got to come to you on our, on our knees, on our face, both figuratively and literally, Lord in humble submission and acknowledge who you are and seek your will. Lord, help us to realise the need to read your word, to study it, to soak it in and to rely on you as we do so that we can be enlightened, so that we can know who you are, so that our passion for you will grow greater and greater, Lord, and the natural outcome will be that we want to praise you. We'll just be gobsmacked with our mouth dropped open in awe of you and we want to worship you, Lord. God, please help us to be faithful. Lord, show our shortcomings, and Lord, our God, we rely on you as, it's, as you've declared in your word, as we've departed seen today. We need you. You've given yourself for us, and you just want to work an amazing work in us and for us. So, Lord, thank you for the privilege, and we rely on you. Amen. Amen. Thank you.